What's up, guys? Hope you're ready for some more Four Horsemen action. All right, when I last left off, I was talking about the format in general and uh, giving you an introduction to the deck that I played in the live webcam tournament that uh, transpired about a month and a half ago now, actually. And uh, it was a four rounds of pod play followed by a top eight. And um, I, uh, I played all four of those matches kind of in the, I think, the third week of the event. I've actually got them all documented on video, one myself and three that I'm getting from um, two of the organizers. And I actually intend to cover those games with commentary provided by uh, myself and my good friend, Nate Prodzik, who you guys are probably familiar with. Nate has already signed up to uh, help me out with that. And uh, it should be a pretty fun project, actually, provided that people are interested in watching Four Horsemen games. Just as an introduction for people who are watching this video for the first time and uh, haven't seen the introductory videos I did with live cards a couple days ago, Four Horsemen is a is a relatively brand new old school format that is uh, kind of a work in progress organized by a bunch of old school aficionados who are tired of the established old school formats, uh, Atlantic, Eternal Central, Pacific, French, etc., different rule sets, all kind of various iterations of the same central theme, and they asked the question of what would old school magic look like if you skipped the alpha edition and just went straight to Arabian Nights and included cards from Arabian Nights Through the Dark. It turns out that it's a pretty interesting format. It definitely has some uh, some glaring issues. Foremost is the fact that uh, if you look at the entire card pool that's available in Four Horsemen, there really aren't a lot of ways to kill enchantments. In fact, the only card that straight up kills enchantments outside of Desert Twister, which is, you know, sort of the Vindicate of the Era, or that deals directly with enchantments, is the enchantment from Legends called Presence of the Master, which prevents other enchantments from coming into play. And that's about it, which means that cards like Land Tax and Moat and Sylvan Library and Spirit Link and Abyss and a few other ones are kind of just indestructible. There's no way to interact with them. And that's a, a pretty glaring problem. And unfortunately... Outside of creating novel and weird band-aid solutions like inventing new cards or allowing you to play with cards from Alpha that deal specifically with enchantments, there isn't really any easier, elegant way around it. And it may prove, unfortunately, to be the undoing of the format. But that doesn't mean you can't have some fun in the meantime with uh, experimenting with different builds and innovating in different ideas in, uh, in this brand new format. They're actually currently up to tournament number five, and my deck was played in tournament number four. Um, some changes have been made to the format. I did mention these before, but the main the main change that was made for tournament number four was the inclusion of uh, the revised dual lands, which was a suggestion that I made to help some decks shore up some fundamental weaknesses. So, for example, if you're playing a blue-black deck, you don't have any way to kill artifacts either, but if you can splash tundras or you can splash bayous or something, you might have a way to uh, splash crumble or divine offering or something so that you've got some interaction with artifacts. But anyway, this is the deck that I used in the event. This is the exact build that I covered uh, with my live cards. And um, as we moved into the top eight, the organizer published all of the top eight deck lists, as is pretty standard in these formats, just to give people a little bit of insight into what their opponents might be using. I knew what my quarterfinal opponent, who he was and what he'd be playing. And as soon as I looked at his deck list, it was pretty apparent to me that uh, the match felt like it would be pretty lopsided, with the exception of possibly the problematic issue with the blood moons that he had access to in his sideboard but i did i built his deck i did some testing against it and uh didn't seem like blood moon was strong enough and threatening enough to really make a difference and i think i won all but maybe two out of 12 or 13 test games and i think i lost both of those games to early blood moons but the remainder of the games felt fine and i felt confident enough in that matchup that i, I should be able to mow through him and it turns out that that he was probably my easiest opponent over uh, over the first five matches that I played by nature of the fact that he just drew really poorly against me too. And he would have had to draw quite well to beat me, uh, like I said, with an early Blood Moon that I had no answer to in the form of Mana Drain. And uh, I drew good basic lands against him. I mean, my draws are great. His draws are quite weak, probably in the bottom, I don't know, fifth, five to tenth percentile for his deck. And I mowed through him quite quickly. But when I went and saw my next opponent's deck list, I, uh, I had the opposite impression. Um, my opponent was named uh, Matthew. I don't recall his last name. I'll definitely mention it in a later video once I look it up. But as, uh, as weak as my quarterfinal opponent's deck appeared to be against mine, Matthew's deck was the exact opposite. And as soon as I looked at his deck list, I went, oh man, shit, this is going to be really, really tough. 
And uh, so without further ado, I'm going to show you guys the deck that Matt built. Matt's deck is basically Golgari Workshops. What a cool novel idea on this. As soon as I saw his deck, my first, my first impression was, wow, I really, really like this. I really like the innovation behind it. I think it's extremely creative. Keep in mind, this is a totally unestablished format. It is, it's really the Wild West still. Nobody's really figured out what is the best archetype even in the format, particularly once you have the addition of these, uh, these dual lands. And, uh, and I really love the, the direction that Matt went. Most of the people that have been playing workshops in this format have been going heavily blue, if not straight mono blue, sometimes splashing uh, red, maybe splashing black, potentially green, but nobody had gone Golgari workshops. But the more I looked at this deck and I kind of thought about how it specifically measured up against mine, the, the more and more concerned I got. And there's a lot of reasons for it, and I'll try to give you a quick breakdown for them. First of all, if you look at my deck, one of the primary threats in my deck and one of the reasons why I was really drawn to blue-white control is because it's probably the best archetype to run land tax. Because you've got Ivory Tower or your, and, um, and Felwar Stones to, to develop early and to just stall the game out. You have Sylvan Library to, to uh, draw extra cards and refill your hand relatively quickly to power the towers. And Land Tax really allows you to control the pace of the game. And if you look at Matt's deck, oops, that's not Matt's deck, that's my blue red green test deck. Um, if you look at Matt's deck, look at how good this deck is against Land Tax. He has four copies of Elves of Deep Shadow, which is like the Lanor Elf of the format. He has three Scavenger Folk to kill off the early ivory towers, so you can't just sit on that with land tax in play. He has four Felwar stones, and he also has three copies of Argothian Pixies and three Sylvans. Tons of powerful, impactful things to do early, so he can just ignore land tax. He can just go turn one, forest, elves of deep shadow, next turn tap them both and cast a Felwar stone, and tap the Felwar stone to, or, and then the next turn maybe cast another Felwar Stone and another Elves of Deep Shadow, or cast a Pixies, and then ramp all the way up to Suchi and Urnam Jins. And if you're just sitting there trying to play the land tax game against him, you're going to be so far behind by the time you just essentially concede the fact you're not going to be able to land tax and start trying to develop that he'll already be uh, beating your face in. And unless you're able to ramp straight to Moat to stop him, you're probably going to lose the game. And even if you get Moat against him, this is another huge problem with his deck, is that a lot of these workshop decks or aggro decks die to Moat, and he's running two Clockwork Avians, and three copies of Tetravis also, in addition to the, the obligatory Fortress Galleons that all the Workshop decks use. So he has the ability to deal with Moat also, and if you've taken a ton of early damage, you could just lose the game to a Clockwork Avian hitting you a few turns. And if you notice, I'm only running one main deck Divine Offering. And so the more I looked at Matt's deck, the, the more I became increasingly worried about one specific card also. And so I'm going to go back and have you guys look at the Golgari Shops deck for a bit. You can just study it and use your instincts just looking at his main deck. What do you think the card is, obviously, outside of City in a Bottle, which I mentioned in my video, is extremely problematic against my deck and actually the reason why I ultimately ran with a, a main deck Divine Offering uh, because I don't have a way to win realistically if City in a Bottle comes out. If I'm unable to counter it, it kills all my Cities of Wrath immediately. It kills my Serendib of which are the primary way that I actually win a lot of these games. And sure, I can shore up behind Moat. I can even play Mirror Universe. But how do I deal the final point of damage? All I've got is two Preachers, and if I have Moat in play, Preacher's never going to be able to attack, and even if I don't have Moat in play, what are the chances without any kind of sweepers or removal that I'm going to ever be able to slip through for a point of damage with a Preacher? Not going to happen. So if Sitting in a Bottle resolves in Game 1 and I don't have that Divine Offering, I just lose the game, and he's got a main deck Sitting in a Bottle and lots of Sylvans to get it. But that is not the number one problematic thing. I'm going to give you guys a couple more seconds here to think about what card am I most concerned by when we look at this deck list. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, time's up. The card is whoop, Tetravis. This thing right here, such an absolute nightmare for my deck. I only have one main deck way to kill it. And uh, once it's in play, what exactly do I do against Tetravis? If you just look at what I have, I don't have Swords to Plowshares, which is obviously the card that you would normally use to deal with Tetravis. I don't have main deck Disenchant other than the single copy of Divine Offering. Mana draining it even is a bit of a risky proposal, given the fact that it's a mana burn format, and six mana handed to you if you don't have any way to deal with it could be lethal. So, And I'm not running Misha's Factory, so I don't have any way to pump that mana into anything. So mana draining it, I mean, it's kind of like a decent solution, but still taking six totally sucks. Short of playing Serendib of Freed and Spirit Linking it to potentially trade damage, that's kind of... A semi answer. I could put two Serendibs out against it, but then I'm sitting there taking two damage a turn to hold off the Tetravis. 
really the, my only answer to it is mirror universe and he's got uh he has three scavenger folk that could just be sitting in play and i have no way to kill them off which means that he could just have a scavenger folk or two sitting in play and basically my mirrors would be doa i'd pay six mana and he pays one and destroys it. So the more I thought about it, the more I realized how deadly Tetravis really was against me and how unprepared I am to deal with the card pre-sideboard. And um, so those two factors alone really made me very, very nervous about this matchup. And true to form, I played a bunch of games against myself, and it was not looking good. And so I did what I had to do. When I go into these events, I really like to be prepared. Um, and that's sort of my motto, no matter what kind of event I'm playing in, whether or not it's the old school world championship, which I put in like three or four solid months of work for, or it's just a little online event like this with 30 or 40 people in it. I just want to always want to feel like I'm putting my best foot forward and doing my best work. And that means that I, I need to feel like I'm making the best decisions in both my main deck and sideboard in particular. And uh, that meant I had to do some play testing. And so I was able to conscript my, my good friend Nate to uh, step up to help me out with uh, a bunch of play test games in advance of my matchup against Matt. And I've got a whole bunch of Magic Online games to showcase the games that Nate and I played. And those are coming up right away. Um, before I get to those, though, I want to touch on the sideboard a little bit. I think that as, as good as Matt's main deck is, and it has so many amazing innovations, I love the addition of All Hall as Eve in here, too. This is a card that seems very powerful in, in, uh, in theory, but really, really hard to utilize because it's double black. And if you look at the card pool, both red and black, ironically, given how strong they are in alpha, are very, very weak colors in Four Horsemen. There just aren't really enough things in black to pull you into those colors, particularly in terms of the creatures. And red's creatures are just the worst. They are unbelievably terrible in these four sets. I mean, when were the first good red creatures even made outside of alpha? Are there even any good red creatures in the dark? I guess there's ball lightning. But it took ages before good red creatures started to get printed, and there are definitely none in this, uh, in this card pool. I mean, you've got like Aladdin... Ali from Cairo, like creatures that don't even attack. It's just, they're hilariously terrible. Firestorm, Phoenix, Bird Maiden, they're just garbage. And uh, so consequently, nobody's playing red for the creatures, and nobody's really playing black for the anything. But All Hallows Eve, fantastic in this deck. He's got two copies of Bizarre Baghdad to kind of leverage the card quite a bit and just fill the graveyard up with stuff. He allows him to recycle all of these Triskelions, to recycle the Tetravises, maybe the Clockwork Avians if they've died for whatever reason. And... Uh, very, very threatening against me. It, it, by mid-game, this is a must-counter card. You cannot let it resolve, even though it's kind of an, an interesting design. For those of you who aren't familiar with All Hallows' Eve, this was the original Suspend card. It was Suspend long before there was Suspend. So you cast it as a sorcery. It gets suspended with two scream, scream counters on it. You remove one one of them during upkeep, and when the, when the second uh, Suspend counter, second Scream counter is removed, it resolves and it brings all creatures from all graveyards directly into play. It's not living death. It doesn't kill the things that are currently in play, but it does regrow all the graveyards. And given that my deck has almost no creatures and his has tons of Triskelions and other big monsters, uh, All Hallows Eve could very likely spell my doom if it resolves by mid-game. So really, really love these innovations. Again, I can't say enough good things about Matt's deck. Incredibly impressive, very, very creative, and I really, really like it. I mean, anything that's gonna, anything that's gonna take this deck down or down to the wire given how strong this deck i think is in the format um it's just speaks to to just design brilliance so um moving to the sideboard as good as matt's deck is main deck i think that the sideboard uh leaves a little bit to be desired there are some really cool innovations here as well i love the use of eureka i think this is a uh, an underutilized card particularly as a sideboard card against slow control strategies because he can play it on turn three or turn four and i kind of have to counter it if i if i do have a counter spell because i just if he's got five or six cards in his hand, what the hell do I do? Do I just let it resolve and let him put two Tetravises and two Triskelions into play? Like, there's no way to know what the guy has. And I don't have anything approaching the power level of these big drops, of these, you know, these six drops and five drops and stuff. I mean, I could put a moat into play for free, maybe a Serenity for free, or like an extra land tax. But compared to what he can do with Eureka, devastating. I have to counterspell it. And that gets even more dangerous after sideboarding, when he could go Eureka and put two Mirror Universe into play. And if I don't have Artifact Kill on hand right away, Mirror Universe, because of Mana Burn being in the format and um, him having four workshops, could kill me in a couple of turns. And the reason why that is is because um, Chad, one of the organizers, was really adamant that he wanted Four Horsemen to preserve a lot of the original rules also because it's such a flavorful format. And if you, if you were playing back in 94, you remember back to the era of 1994, not only was there Mana Burn, but there was a bunch of other really weird non-intuitive rules 
for example, the fact that um, you did not die until the phase ended. So you could actually go to zero or negative life points if you uh, had a way to get back to positive life before the phase ended. So with, with uh, the fact that you can mana burn yourself means that once you get a mirror online, you can burn yourself very quickly with workshops and other mana producers, get your life total down to one, get to your upkeep. During your upkeep, you tap Elves of Deep Shadow to reduce yourself down to zero, just like a City of Brass, and then you switch life with your opponent through Mirror Universe, and you hand them zero life, and you take all their life total, and they fall over dead, unless they can gain life also, which is pretty damn deadly, and one of the most powerful ways to end a game in, well, in the 1994, 95, 96 era, and obviously in Four Horsemen as well. He's got uh, two Guardian Beasts, which I also like, just to kind of go with the Mirror Plan. Guardian Beast needs to be untapped, and for those who aren't too familiar with it, including Nate in our, one of our early games, uh, Guardian Beast also does not protect artifact creatures from destruction. So it does not protect Misha's Factories or Suchi, Clockwork Avian, any of these guys. But it does protect Mirrors, does protect City in a Bottle and Felwar Stones, and can prove very, very problematic combined with Mirror Universe in a long, grindy game. He's got a couple of Crumbles. Would have liked to probably see more of these just to have more artifact kill. I think extra Crumbles, maybe an extra Scavenger Folk would have been best since given how good artifact-based archetypes are in the format. He's got another Sylvan Library for the uh, anti-control strategy, which is fantastic as well and if the if the um if the deck has any real weakness in the sideboard anything that just sticks out to me as being as being unnecessary and kind of uh crappy is the uh the two whirling dervishes not that whirling dervish is a bad card and i can kind of understand why he might wanted to use it just because it's anti-black but black is so weak in the format it does combine with abyss because abyss is a targeted effect so you can't destroy whirling dervish with the abyss but that's a very unlikely interaction to happen and I just don't think that black is threatening enough in the format to merit this card. And there's this big problem of the double green casting cost. If you notice, he's only got four bayous, two pendlehavens, and three forests. So that's a total of nine green sources. If he's not getting them from Felwar Stones, he has no Cities of Brass. So very, very hard to get double green early in the game in a four strip mine format. And that's really the only time you kind of want Whirling Dervish anyways on turn two. So unlikely to be cast. And I think that these cards could definitely be replaced by something a little bit more impactful for the weaker matches that this deck might have. Maybe just extra crumbles, extra sta scavenger folk, maybe some life gain. There's a lot of different ways you could have taken it. You could have actually played even more of this because this deck, I mean, this card seems like it would be terrible against a control deck like mine, but it's actually very problematic too. I have a hard time winning the game against the Abyss, particularly if he's got a handful of artifact kill and I don't have any discard. And uh, Abyss just shuts my Serendib Afrits off, completely keeps him out of the game as well as any sideboard creatures I might run. And uh, in the test games we played, Nate started running Abyss, and it was a pain in the ass every time he played it. So maybe more Abyss. There's a lot of different ways that this this uh, sideboard could have been built. And I think that Matt probably did not put as much thought into the sideboard as he did into the main deck. Not that I really want to criticize it, because I don't want to take anything away from the main deck. Um, but yeah, that was the strategy. And uh, looking at it, the more I looked at it, the more I studied it, I played some games myself, and it just looked, it looked ominous, honestly. So... I brought Nate on board to help me play test to really figure out what my sideboard strategy was going to be because I really wanted to win this match to get to uh, the finals. And um, so I think we played a total of about a dozen games or so. I'm going to, uh, I'm actually going to just start a video for the, for the, um, for the first game of mine um, in the next video here since I've already talked a little while about the deck techs. And uh, so stay tuned for that. I've got the uh, first of many games coming up between Nate and me, and I will see you guys over there.